All right, everybody. Thanks for watching another episode of The Creative Truth. Today, we're with, um, talking with my buddy, Alex Fedrizi, who's an audio expert. And I've known him forever. And uh, this is actually the first remote uh, interview I've done for The Creative Truth. And we're just kind of getting things back in the uh, swing of things. So we'll just see how it goes. So I guess first, uh, do you want to do your best to intro yourself? Because I, I'm going to butcher it. Sure. So uh, I went to school for music recording. Um, I got an associate's degree. Um, one of my favorite classes while I was there was a live production class. Um, I also had several roommates that owned a small PA system and audio equipment and recording equipment. And so we would um, we'd go to bars and do sound for local bands. And then we would record in our dorm room as well as the studios there. So really getting my hands, you know, in hands-on experience in all facets of it. And um, after uh, college, I got a job working at a um, local audio company um, in Syracuse, New York. And I worked there for about two and a half years as a monitor engineer and system tech and um, system engineer. So basically mixing with the band here is, and then um, being the uh, technician when a band had their own engineer and um, just learning on the job there. Um, I really um, embrace the fake it till you make it, um, it you know, it, uh, mindset as far as like, just learn as much as you can, know as much as you can, and just go, you know, make sure, you know, you're asking the right questions and um, asking questions and, you know, learning as you go and just don't make the same mistakes over and over again. And um, so that's how I've learned all of my jobs is just really getting hands on on the job training. And for me, that's the best way to learn. Um, and then after that, um, I went to school for business for two semesters um, at Syracuse University. Um, I left that job. It wasn't a great company to work for. And I wanted to get my bachelor's degree. So I moved on to that. Um, I didn't finish my bachelor's degree after my two semesters. I, um, somebody I had met through that first job, um, they contacted me and said, I have a you know, tour that's you know, going all across the US uh, and Canada, starts in Canada. Um, I know the, uh, tour manager and do you, you know, are you interested in working for them? So I talked to the tour manager and 10 days later, I got on an airplane and flew to Vancouver. And that was how I ended up, um, working on, uh, music tours, just traveling around the country with artists and, um, being a technician and then an engineer and, um, the audio provider who provided the equipment for that tour, cause the tour actually traveled around with their own equipment. Um, they, I met the account rep and he continued to hire me for other jobs. Um, so he was really my connection into that company. And then the engineer that mixed the band, um, he got me, he connected me with a different company. And so I got in with them and started working for them as well. Um, and then I worked, I did that for about six years before I, uh, moved to Nashville and took a job in the office, um, at that same company that was the provider on the first tour I did. Um, and then, uh, COVID hit, I got furloughed, laid off, then hired back doing AV installations. So now I'm doing more on the job training, learning all about subjects that I had no idea about video and lighting and control and, um, the fact that you can go into a corporate boardroom and click one button and it turns on the projectors and the, the shades go down over the windows and the, um, the input changes and the audio changes and everything changes so that once you click that button, you just plug your laptop in and you can do a presentation and everything does itself. So, um, that's what I'm learning now. Cool. So when you were like 17 or 18 or whenever you were starting out, do you remember what like your goal was or your vision for what you'd be doing? Um, I never thought I would go on the road. I never thought I would be on a tour. I never thought I would meet any artists. I wanted to work in a studio. Um, I had a band. Um, I recorded that band and friends bands and you know, my parents' basement. And um, again, just learning as I go and doing the research, Googling everything that I don't know how to do and, um, you know, buying books and reading and 
you know, focus books on certain topics um, and just learning the things that I don't know so that I can just continue to get better and better at it. Um, you know, spent my Christmas money on recording equipment and had my own stuff so that I could just, you know, have my own time to figure it out. Whereas, you know, when you go in a studio, you have limited time or when you're at school, you have to share that time with other people. So um, it's always been nice to be, to have my own, you know, basic equipment basic setup so that I can, you know, sit down and record something by myself and play around with it and, you know, have the time to learn on my own. So, but did I know what I was going to do? What my vision was? No, I just, I thought I wanted to work in a recording studio and I knew that I liked music and I liked um, recording and um, I liked the idea of live audio, but I didn't think about doing it until college. And then after when I got the job really, um, for you, for some context, the creative truth is like basically just it, it's just like a podcast about inspiring other people who want to get into uh, some sort of creative field, whether it's being like a, an artist and selling their art and, or supporting themselves from art sales or like working like in a professional role like you're doing now. So for it seems like for the first half of your career or for the first most of your career, you were a contract employee and now you've kind of gotten a flavor of like the corporate audio and like the corporate world and the desk job. Like tell me a little bit about like what's good about being a contract employee. What's good about, you know, being a salaried employee. Um, so what's bad about each. Sure. Uh, what's, what was great about being a, oh, so I started as a, you know, um, was kind of freelance, kind of not. Um, I would, I had, um, you know, I was on the payroll, but I only got paid if I worked. So, um, but I would get paid a day rate. So, um, I, sorry. Um, so basically I, you know, I was kind of an employee, but kind of not, um, there were no benefits with the job, but, so I was kind of working like a freelance and I would, um, sorry, my boss is calling, um, the, uh, the downsides of having a employer <laughs> working for a corporate company. Um, so, um, yeah, kind of worked as a freelance, kind of as a, um, employee that was, you know, it was an okay arrangement when I started, um, because I didn't really know what the rates were, what, you know, what people paid for, you know, in the local market, what people paid for on the touring market, all of those things. Um, so, um, after that, um, I, when I started to work as a freelance, um, you know, I got offered my first job and it was more money than I was making per, you know, basically I was paid per day. So on that tour, they were giving me a week rate and I could divide that by seven and figure out that I was going to make more money per day on that. And it was a long stretch of time, seven weeks. So, um, that was a good chunk of money at that time. Um, so enough to forego college, um, having, you know, at that time I was working or working towards my bachelor's degree. So, um, I took a leave of absence and went and worked. Um, just the opportunity was something that I never thought I would have. So, and I didn't think I'd get offered again. So college would always be there. So I figured I could always go back. Um, but working, so working as a freelance, um, in the, the first, so there were that tour lasted three legs. Basically it was seven weeks in the summer and then six weeks in the fall and six weeks in the following spring. And after the second leg, um, I was starting to ask questions, you know, of other people like, you know, how much do you make per day? Or, you know, maybe not directly, but kind of listening and figuring out what the, you know, what was going on, what people were saying. And um, I found out that, you know, a lot of people were making a lot more money than I was. Um, so I just kind of took that information. And on the last, for the last leg, I said, you know, hey, I've been doing a great job. Um, everybody's raving about me, you know, um, obviously a little more modest, but um, <laughs> here, here's the work that I've done. Here's, you know, um, why you should give me more money. And this is the rate that I want. And they didn't even hesitate and just said, okay. okay. Yep. And so I was like, all right. So obviously that wasn't too much money. So, um, after that, um, I got, when I started working for the account rep for the company I'm at now, um, 
he, you know, I told him, well, I was making this much money on this tour. And he said, well, for this position that I have here, there's not enough money in the budget for that. So, um, you know, I can give you a couple hundred dollars less a week. Um, and so I accepted because it was the first, you know, tour with that company, but I wasn't going to, you know, let that be the, the norm. I wanted to be back at the rate I was at before. So, um, I, the, the next tour and, and he, you know, he could tell that and he knew he couldn't, he didn't have it to offer me. So, you know, there's a give and take. And so the next tour that he offered was something that could pay more money. Um, so he was looking at, you know, like he knows I want to make more money. So he kind of placed me in another tour that made more money. Um, at least strategically, I think that's, you know, how it worked out. And, um, so over time I've, you know, as I've, I took on different roles or learned different things because in the audio world on a tour, there's multiple jobs. Um, you could be, um, you could be an RF engineer and, um, you know, be working with a radio spectrum and wireless microphones and wireless belt packs. And you can, um, you could work as an engineer. Um, you can work as a technician on the stage. Um, just all you have to do is patch cables. You can be a technician where you're making sure that the consoles and the, you know, the wireless microphone systems and all those things are working together every day. And that's, you know, your job is really to make sure that that stuff works and, you know, consistently and there's no problems. And if there are problems, you're able to figure out what it is quickly or, you know, um, know the right people to call to help you, you know, walk you through it. And you need to be able to go through all the steps, troubleshooting and figuring that out. And then you can also be the one that um, actually designs what the speaker system, you know, looks like and does in the venue, um, which is a whole different job. And uh, each of those have, you know, different pay rates and, um, and based on the artist and how big they are, you can get paid more or less money. And so I just continued to push every time I'd get a different job, I'd be like, well, I'm going to be doing this thing that's different than what I did last time. And it's a lot more wireless channels. You know, I wanted this rate, you know, and I'd add a couple hundred dollars a week and okay. And so like I kept, you know, every time I'd get a different job, try something new, it'd be like, uh, you know, it was a, for me, it was always a chance to ask for more money. And I was always trying to find the ceiling. What was the most amount that they'll pay for this job um, for anybody. And I knew that, you know, if I wasn't going into it confident that I was, you know, the best at what I was doing, I wouldn't necessarily push it because I wanted to get the experience. Um, but I'd still, you know, still be negotiating. But if I was going in and I knew, you know, like once I had done that job and I knew that I could go on a tour and, you know, make the engineer happy doing what I was doing, then I would just ask for as much as I could and try to get the max because I'm like, well, I know that I'm going to make this engineer happy and if they don't have the budget to pay me enough, then um, I'll have to find something else or I'll have to, you know, accept the lower rate. And if it's an artist that I want to work with, or if it's an artist that's good to work for, and it might be worth, you know, less money just to be taken care of, uh, you know, as a person and have a good experience on, you know, while you're out of town. So, um, I've always been under the mentality of, you know, push, you know, hard and fast, but make sure that, you know, you're, you're really providing the value that goes along with that money as well. So are you allowed to talk about any of the acts you've been on tour with? I know, um, you're, I know you're humble. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, yeah, it's, it's kind of an odd subject to talk about um, for me, but so, I, I'm so, fine. What do you want to ask about? Well, so let's, about how about anything. this? I can think of a couple uh, stories that you've told me. Um, give me like one, is this real life moment from when you were on the road with, with one of the tours you were on? Oh boy. Um, one or two, you can tell me a couple if you want. Hmm. I remember you told me you were playing uh, soccer with someone at, at one point. That's true. So there was a British artist that I worked with um, who they would, um, on their days off or at least one or two days off on the tour, they would find a local soccer field and a local um, soccer team, like college soccer team or something. And they would basically just schedule a, a game to go and play at the college um, soccer um, field. So, um, you know, one day I'm there on the, you know, field with the artist, you know, or the, I guess, five artists and the, that you've heard of and uh you know and a local soccer team and we're just playing against each other and um it's 
amazing when the, you know, the artists include the, you know, the crew on those kinds of things. And also just the fact that, you know, they're regular down to earth people that just want to have a good time on the day off and they have, you know, interests and, you know, they find ways to, um, to do those things while they're on the road. Even though they're like, you know, top 40, like, big 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 act yeah exactly. Yeah, selling out yeah. stadiums so, you know yeah. um their net worth is in the you know hundreds of millions of dollars and um not that that you know and the yeah they're top of the charts and they're just people that you wouldn't normally mingle with so what are some places that you've gone like as a result of following this path well i've been to i've been to all 50 states i've been to you've gigged um, in all 50 states I've also done a show in all 50 states, yep. yeah, um, which is a, a feat in itself. I, I don't know that there's many other people out there who can say that. Um, there's uh, including I've been to Alaska, Asia. too. What's that? Including Alaska, Alaska and Hawaii. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've also uh, I've been to um, all but one of the Canadian provinces um, and done shows there, although none of the territories. So. I haven't been up, you know, in the white north, but there's probably no or very few concert venues way up there. So not much I can do up there. Uh, I've been to Asia. Um, I've been to, uh, so Japan, South Korea. Um, uh, I've been to Australia, New Zealand, um, and I've been to Europe quite a few times. Um, so I think all in all, I've been to more than 20 countries. I haven't counted recently. And I, I know have you, my I have my map over there, my pin map. I actually have a pin in every every city and every country that I've been to. And I love to travel, so I'm always like excited. Where are you today? Where are you today? And you're like, <laughs> yeah. oh yeah, I don't know. I'm in like you know, <laughs> you don't even know. Like I'm in Korea or whatever. Or I'm in yeah. Japan. <laughs> so so anyway, I but you have to like now's a chance for you to be like this can open a lot of doors for you if. Um, and we'll, and we'll get to the future of the industry a little bit later, but, sure. um, but are, have, were there any specific, like, and you, you touched on a little bit, were there any specific like big breaks or was it a series of small breaks or are there like a couple moments in your career where you're like, okay, this is like going to be something and this is something I should pursue and a path I should like go down. It was a lot of small breaks. I mean, it was really incremental, but it was a, fast snowball i guess um in the in the touring world you know a tour lasts for a finite amount of time so it's not like a job where you could work there for 20 years and you know not do anything else um a tour may last two weeks it could last six weeks it could last a week it could you could just go do one show um or it could be seven or ten or i think the longest i did was um uh two no three and a half months i think i was gone and that was the longest and that's the only one that i've ever done that was longer than um i think eight weeks um also with a pretty like big 14 pretty yeah big and that effect. was a big big artist europe and the u.s um yeah. for yeah, for a long time so um that was uh that was the longest so but once that's over you have to find something else because there you know you don't have any income if you're not working um as a freelance so um, it was, you know, with that said, it was very incremental and it would, um, you know, like I said, I was, I l left that first job. Um, the company wasn't great to work for. Um, but I was happy with the experience and the time I had there and the, the freedom I had at the small company and, um, really made the most of my time there and learning everything that I could. And once I felt that I was, I ran out of room to improve. That was when I was like, okay, I need to find something else to grow and move forward. And that's when I, you know, decided to go back to school as a way to do that. Um, very interested in business and, you know, learning and studying about business. So, um, you know, working towards a bachelor's degree in business was a natural move for me. And, um, especially since when I took that first job, um, I actually didn't mention that I was, um, I was enrolled to go back to college for business after my associate's degree to get a bachelor's. And I actually forego that opportunity in order to take that first job. Um, because at that time I knew that job wouldn't be there forever. Um, you know, that was, an, you know, an opportunity in, um, in a creative, uh, 
field that I didn't know, you know, there was a lot of opportunity in at all. So when I got the opportunity, I, I seized that and uh, just went for it. So um, I had already put school on my old. bachelor's degree. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, same logic. School will be there. I can always go back. Um, it gets harder as you get older to go back. And um, once, especially once you're making money and paying off your bills, then you don't want to go back and, you know, have to borrow money to rack up more bills. And, um, but, uh, you know, for me, I do want to eventually get my bachelor's degree and finish that education. Um, it's just got to be at the right time. But you could, um, you obviously don't need it though. I mean, like, uh, right. You know, right. We're, we're all being forced to reinvent ourselves right now, but yeah. you've been, you've been successful and you're not even 30 and you've already, you know, been on world tours and stuff. So that's right. I haven't, it, it is a it. fast, fast, uh, it's a, um, it's a check mark on my, you know, list of boxes, but not necessarily, um, necessary. Sure. So what's the, so, what's the best part and the worst part of being on the road? Um, so the, one of the best parts is that you're, you, especially if you have an artist that's taking care of you, you're really, um, uh, and you're on a big enough tour where you have tour buses and things like that. Um, you get on the bus, you wake up, you're at the next venue, you're at work, you just go, you work. It's a long day, but uh, at the end of the day, you get, you know, they order pizza or food for you after the show and you sit on the bus, drink some beers and um, you really, you know, you really get to know your coworkers uh, really well because you basically live with them for seven weeks in a bus. And on your days off, you get to go, you know, in a hotel room and have your, you know, time by yourself where you're not, you know, stuck with the same people, especially if you don't get along, but the people that don't get along don't last very long on tours because people won't put up with it. So um, if it's creating a bad environment, then they won't be invited back. You know, they'll find somebody else. So it's, um, you know, a lot of times you'll get a crew of people that you get along with and you can, you know, you really get to know them. So you make really, you know, deeper connections with them than you would um, on like a normal job or passing through or, you know, you have coworkers in this department and that department, but you don't really get to know them. But when you're really living with them for six or seven weeks, you really get to know them. Um, and so that's one of the better things that you make stronger connections and the industry is small. And, um, once you, you know, at this point you can make, um, once you may, you know, I can ask, I can find a connection with anybody now that, you know, knows if I meet somebody, I can be like, Oh, what tours have you been on? And if they name a few, I can say, Oh, do you know this person or that person? Because the the industry is so small and, um, people are, um, you make those connections and everybody knows everybody. So, um, and that's the, you know, for this industry, that's the, that's how you get your work is, you know, by impressing somebody and, you know, keeping those contacts alive and um, talking to them in between, you know, tours and just, you know, keeping those relationships open and, you know, they'll remember you did a good job and they'll recommend, you know, when the time comes and somebody says, Oh, I need somebody for this position. I can't find anybody. It's busy that, you know, they may reach out to you. And um, if you keep at the top of their inbox or you're, you know, every couple of weeks emailing them, they'll, you know, they'll think of you first. So. Did you make any mistakes along the way? Oh, sure. Um, absolutely. Um, trying to think of a good example. I certainly wore myself out, pushed myself to, um, you know, uh, you know, the burnout phase. Um, I did a five week tour and then flew from that to a seven week tour. And that was a, um, and the seven week tour was not a great, um, atmosphere on the tour. So, it was uh, really stressful. Um, and I took a position that I was uh, on the edge of comfortable with. So um, I was really trying to do my best and be good at it. And when things weren't going well, it wasn't, you know, um, it always sounded great. But when the other things, you know, that go along with making it sound great, um, you know, when those things don't go well, it, it makes for stressful days. And so, um, really knowing, you know, my limits, I've, I've learned a lot about myself as far as just, you know, how I act when I'm, or, you know, how I present myself, how I act, how I feel when I'm, you know, get rested well versus when I'm 10 weeks into a tour and I'm tired and, you know, you've been working 
four or five 16 hour days a week um, for an extended period of time, it really wears on you. So um, just learning those things about myself and, um, and then being able to reflect on that and learn ways to, um, you know, uh, either relax or um, kind of blow off that steam in between. Um, that's a, that's a big one. The downtime in between. Um, so what kind of people don't make it or they don't last long in the industry? And then what kind of people set themselves up for success? Like what are the values you need, the morals, like what kind of people in general, what kind of people do well in your industry? The, the people who are, you know, willing to learn and ask questions and um, they're technically, you know, you know, I've never felt that I'm the best at any of the jobs that I've done. I'm, you know, I do a good enough job that, you know, and I'm, um, I create great relationships and um, I, I'm good at that part of it. So um, I, I, I like to say I can get at 90% of the, you know, of what the best is or 85%, let's say, but um, I don't need to be the very best, like the, the pickiest making it perfect, like that kind of, that doesn't, you know, um, once I get to a certain skill level and I'm able to do it, I move on to learn other things. Um, whereas other people, like they really hone in and they learn one thing really, really well, and they mm -hmm. are the best at it. Mm -hmm. Um, and those people make it as well. That's a, you know, um, but the, the thing that doesn't make it is, you know, a poor attitude or, um, just, you know, negativity, um, the people that are always negative or, ha you know, have a negative attitude or vibe all the time. Um, it, where, you know, it, you know, people do this thing called mirroring where when one person is, you know, acts a certain way, then they may act a certain way back to them. So, and when, you know, that continuously happens, it, it can create a bad atmosphere. So really the, the people that are there um, and they're enjoying themselves there, they're, you know, they're there to, you know, do a good job and they're there to, you know, and they're professional and uh, those are the people that make it and the people that are just, you know, jerks or, um, they think they're the best, but they really don't know anything or, you know, those are the, um, you know, if you come in and you say, you know, all this stuff and then you don't, and then you act like a jerk, nobody's going to, you know, hire you back. But if you come in and you don't know the things you're supposed to do, but you ask questions, you, you know, um, you're nice about it. You apologize or, you, you know, Oh, sorry, I didn't realize that I'll take care of this. Or, you know, when there's a problem, you're not the first to blame somebody else. You're really saying like, okay, there's a problem. How are we going to fix it? And then once it's fixed, okay, why did that happen? And then let's figure out how that's, you know, we can make that not happen again next time. Um, and really taking that approach rather than just pointing fingers. Um, that's important for, you know, that's an important trait. Um, and so you can see that, you know, the two different sides of how to make it and how to not, you really just got to be willing to learn. And, you know, when you start out, go into the role, step back, learn all you can, um, try not to go in, you know, thinking, you know, everything, and then, um, come to find out that you don't. Um, and then, you know, some people try to hide it or they lie or, um, and that's really obvious, especially from somebody who's been around a long time, they know. So just that approach doesn't work. So, and if you make that mistake and you can still find your way onto another tour, you always have another chance um, you know, to do it again differently and learn from your mistakes. Reinvent yourself. Then um, I've, it's always at the end of a tour, I feel like, oh my God, you know, I'm, um, I'm short with people. I, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm always tired. I'm always kind of grumpy, um, that kind of thing. And then, you know, I take the time in between to refresh and I always go into the next tour with a, a fresh head and a, you know, even after a five week tour flying into a seven week tour, the, the second tour, you go in with a fresh mind and try to, uh, you meet all new people. You have to work with all new people. So you can really start, you know, start fresh, um, and then, you know, work from there, but it, it's really, you know, it's important to recharge in between and, you know, self-reflect on those things and um, make sure that you're improving yourself each time and not, not going in and pretending you know everything and then you don't. So personally, and also on a larger scale, this is like, it's just, we'd be remiss to not talk about it. Like how has COVID affected concerts and, and live events? 
I mean, they're pretty much non-existent at this point. Yeah. Um, there's some concerts, small things. There's drive-ins, which are small. Um, drive-ins, you know, they don't allow for a large crowd, so the budgets are very tight. So, you know, they're hiring smaller companies or, um, and uh, there's, because there's so much, uh, or there's so little demand right now, there's so much supply. So um, everybody wants to do it. Um, just to have work, just to keep their people working. So um, they're, you know, they're charging the least amount of money that they can to still make a little bit and pay all of their people and keep them working. Because I mean, it's hard for all of the freelancers out there that, you know, the government changed some rules so that you could collect unemployment. And, but, uh, you know, a lot of people didn't qualify right away or it took time. And, um, you know, they, you could potentially qualify for like a PPP loan or an EIDL, but at first it was really hazy whether you could or not. And people didn't apply because they didn't know if they could or not. And so a lot of people didn't get the help that they needed or, and still can't. And then federal unemployment ended, but all the freelancers in my industry are trying to find other, you know, they're working in warehouses and they're doing other jobs now because they can't, and, and, you know, which is paying a third or a quarter or a fifth of what they used to make mm -hmm. just so that, you know, they can put food on the table and pay the minimum bills or just try to delay bankruptcy or try to delay the inevitable as long as they can until events come back. So you, there's a lot of people that are just kind of hanging on and, um, you know, there, and there's been a lot of tragedies in the industry as well, as far as, you know, mental health and people, you know, just feel that they have no way out. And you were, you said you were earlier, you said you were furloughed and then you were laid off before you got rehired to, to do uh, corporate AV, right? Yeah. Okay. So tell me about the live events coalition. Um, so when I was, uh, I guess it was the week before I was furloughed. Um, I mean, my inbox dried up o over the course of two weeks. We went from, you know, we were bidding on multiple shows and, um, you know, I mean like 10 or 15 tours and working on logistics for March, April, May, June, July, all the way to September, um, really getting, you know, things put together for the next several months. And all of a sudden, um, tours started pausing because they weren't sure what was going to happen. Um, we were hearing about the virus in Asia and, you know, the company that I work for has, um, clients all over the, you know, the tours are going to Europe and Asia and South America. And so we had, um, now, you know, we started hearing about the virus in Europe and South America. And then we had a tour that was flying to South America the next week and they canceled. So that equipment all came back. And then all of a sudden we had tours that were two weeks out. Um, they were starting in two weeks that started to cancel. So we're rushing to stop logistics, you know, equipment that's traveling in from other offices in Canada and, um, and then all of a sudden there was no, there were no bids, everything was stopped and there, you know, and we we're just kind of wait, you know, waiting to see what happened. And, um, it was, it was really eerie <laughs> when it happened. Um, so, but during that week I saw what was happening and the fact that events had, you know, were stopping for March, April, May or March and April, they were really canceling into late April and the ones that were in May, we had, uh, we had three or four that were starting mid-May that were holding off um, and not canceling because at that point we were really, you know, nobody knew it was going to happen in two weeks. And once a week went by, you didn't know what was going to happen for the next two weeks. And then another week went by and you didn't know what was happening for the next two. And you were really living like two weeks at a time trying to figure out what was going on, you know, groceries and all of those things, stacking up on things for two weeks so that you had enough and, you know, because nobody knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. So during that week when my inbox was empty, I reached out to an, a colleague that I knew um, and was just asking how his business was going. And um, it turned out he sent me a link to a petition that he had started um, because his, you know, his business had basically all of the, their shows had canceled as well. So all of a sudden they went from, you know, we have the most amount of work we've ever had booked before the year started in a single year. Um, and this is the story for, I would say, most of the people you talk to. 2020 was going to be the year where they were going to, you know, they had the most shows, they had the most revenue lined up. They were, it's going to be a gangbuster year for everybody. And, um, and then it just went from that to nothing, like overnight. And so he started this petition for government aid for the live events industry because 
the live events industry is strange. It's a, um, like I said, you know, the tours last for six or seven weeks at a time. Um, it's seasonal. Um, the winter time is slow. So a lot of companies have a gap between December 1st and maybe, um, February 1st, which, you know, they have to save the whole year for. And when they get to, you know, now we're at February 1st coming out of the slow season and all of a sudden all the revenue drops off. I mean, they were coming out of a season where they were spending money to stay alive. They didn't have any revenue during that time anyway. And now they're going into no revenue moving forward. And this happened to a lot of freelance people as well. They were coming out of the slow season, ready for that tour to start in late February, early March, when the season starts to pick up and they can guarantee work from them then until April or until September, October. And uh, all of a sudden they have no money. So they had only budgeted for several months and now all of a sudden, you know, they have nothing. And um, so um, the Live Events Coalition, the petition was really looking for government aid for these people, especially because unemployment doesn't count for freelancers. And going into this, you know, that's what we had talked about on that first phone call was all the free, all my freelance colleagues who are still freelance, they don't have, uh, you know, they don't have benefits. They don't have, they're going to lose insurance. They're not going to have money to pay for that insurance because they have no work. They've come out of this slow season with no money. And now they're going into this time with no, um, you don't even know when you're going to work again. Uh, I mean, that's a tough situation to move into. And so um, we are really trying to raise awareness and because of the seasonality um, and a lot of people don't understand the entertainment industry or the touring industry or the events industry as a whole because a lot of people it's a lot of people and we're not meant to be seen you know when when you go to an event you're not supposed to be seen as as an event professional you're supposed to blend in and, and you know the crowd shouldn't know you're there they're there for the experience of the show and so people don't understand how much it takes what are um, some what are some non-audio people who are also like like affected so uh, um, well, uh, on like a typical tour, you have, um, you have audio, video, um, lighting, you have, you know, rigging, uh, riggers who are actually hanging all of the equipment in the air. Um, when you go to a big show, say at an arena, all, um, some people are under the impression that that equipment belongs to the arena, but it actually doesn't. It travels around with the artist. So all of that equipment has to be unloaded and loaded onto trucks. So you're talking about, um, you know, stagehands and, and you, you know, loaders who are loading and unloading trucks and helping you set up all that equipment. And then you have the, this, you know, the, um, the technical labor who knows how all that stuff goes together and they're familiar with the tour and travel around like I do. Um, and then you have the, you know, the skilled labor, like the stagehands who are, you know, they know about audio, they might be able to do your job, but they're really there as a helping hand, but they know about, you know, the topic. So it's, it's easy to work with them and get stuff done. Um, and that, you know, they have experience doing that. Then you have, you know, people like ticket takers and concessions and, um, you have agents and you have, um, managers, uh, tour managers, artist managers, you have VIP managers for the people that are, uh, coordinating the VIP. You have merch, um, you know, people who are selling the merch, the people that are coordinating the merch, the people that are printing the merch, you know, um, the, you know, the, if it's a cotton shirt, I mean, it goes all the way to the, you know, the Supply. sheep that they're, sure. you know, yeah. that they're, <laughs> so sheep are, yeah. um, out of work, <laughs> the sheep are out of work. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the cotton, you know, um, the farms that, you know, grow cotton and, you know, just, wool and all those products. And I mean, it really goes, you know, deep, or if you think of like a wedding, um, you have DJs, you have the, you know, master of ceremonies, you have a planner, you have um, the venue, you have the, you know, the venue staff, the caterers, um, bartenders, and then, you know, beyond that, you have florists, and then you have the people that, you know, that sell the flowers and the people that grow the flowers. Uh, and it goes, you know, it really runs deep when all of those things cancel and you, nobody's ordering flowers. All of a sudden, the person's growing flowers is throwing them away because they're dying before they can sell them or um, so it it takes a lot of people uh, we did a study with the live events coalition uh, you asked about the live events coalition and we really I got on a tangent but um, we did a study early on um, and we called it the ecosystem study and it was 
how many people does it take to put on this event? And it was a, we studied a 200 person gala for like a political or a fundraiser. I can't remember which it was. And it was, or I think it was for 240 people and there were 190 staff to put on that one event for 240 people. So, you know, on smaller events or fundraisers, nonprofit things, I mean, you're talking about a huge amount of people just for one small event. Sure. What, so, what progress have you guys made already? And what, what else needs to happen? So with the Live Events Coalition, so the live events industry doesn't really have an association. And like I said, people don't understand the industry, especially, you know, um, well, not especially, but um, politicians are a part of that group that don't understand um, the entertainment industry. So when they're writing policy and um, trying to give aid to the country, they're not thinking about live events and the special circumstances that go along with the industry, the seasonality and things like that. So, you know, uh, just for an example on, let's say, lending, the, if a bank wants to lend to your business, they want to see consistent income. But if you have a business where three months out of the year, you make no money and eight months out of the year, you make a million dollars, you know, they look at those three months and they say, well, what's wrong with your business? And they really don't understand that like that's the seasonality every year and you just budget for it and you're used to that. And that's, you know, a challenge that you face every year, but you're, you know, you understand that as a business owner, but you know, the bank doesn't understand that because you know, they're, and they're really trying to, uh, you know, they're looking for low risk and high reward. So they're not necessarily looking to understand those things. They want to look for a cookie cutter business that fits the model, a restaurant or, a, you know, um, a hotel or, you know, other businesses. And so the events business is really unique in that way. So, and since people don't understand it, they're not writing policy for it. Um, and so, you know, the language in the bill may not allow you to get the, you know, the bill is passed in Congress and it may not allow you to take advantage of those help programs for businesses, even though you should be eligible, but um, technically nobody thought about you when they wrote the bill and now you don't qualify. So, you know, our goal has really been to educate policymakers and make sure that they know and, um, and work with them to make sure that the bills fit um, you know, our industry. So what we've um, accomplished so far, we've raised awareness through um, some activations called empty events, where we had um, events in different cities that just basically represented the number of people, which the number of people in live events is 12 million. So, and many of those people are still out of work. Um, I mean, so the, um, you know, there would be empty tables set up and the event would just be empty and there would be, you know, a video screen and it, it would just, you know, have facts about the event industry. We're really trying to raise awareness. Um, we partnered with the, um, uh, the Red Alert um, uh, campaign, which was um, they lit up buildings in red all over the country um, and had case pushes where um, companies would take um, road cases and, you know, um, event professionals would go and push them, you know, past the courthouse or through downtown and, um, uh, you know, as a way to bring um, awareness. awareness to our industry. Um, and we've also, you know, at the same time, we've been um, working with a, a firm that does, you know, um, advocacy work and, in Washington DC are, uh, and they're really communicating directly with policymakers and finding out what is happening in Washington so that we have an idea of how to um, affect that in some way. So, um, you know, we found out about, you know, what bills are in, you know, senators, um, what are they drafting? What are the bills that they're drafting or, you know, representatives in the house? And then we're looking at those bills and saying, okay, which one fits our industry the best? And then we went, you know, and we found a, um, an opportunity to speak directly to that senator or that representative um, and say, you know, we support your bill, we like your bill, but here's the things that, you know, would really make it work for our industry. And then go in and say, look, this many of your constituents and this much money is spent in your district for live events. And this really does affect you. And a lot of the time they're surprised at what the numbers are because they just don't realize how much economic value live events has um, in, you know, on the people, on their constituents and in their district. So, 
um, once we had, you know, we had to gather those facts and then go to the policymakers and let them know um, this is what our industry needs mm -hmm. and, you know, work with them to change some language so that we are included in those things. Um, and there's a, a lot of work to be done. I mean, we were really hoping, um, we signed on with, um, something called the restart act, um, which was voted on, well, which was supposed to go to the floor sometime in July. Um, but, um, when, um, Congress went into recess in early August, they didn't vote on anything. And so once that happened, we were stuck in this period between the recess and the election. And so there, you know, nobody was making any moves either way on um, stimulus because they didn't know what was going to happen with the election. And now moving forward past the election, we're, you know, in this period in between where, you know, we're waiting for final election results to come in and, you know, transition into a new administration. So still Congress isn't really making a move on any stimulus and we don't know what that's going to look like. So we're just continuing to keep up on what's happening and making sure that our voice will be represented um, and that will be represented in those bills when they actually hit the floor um, and that we'll be able to take advantage of that aid because our industry is still decimated. And the, the fact is, you know, it's not like all of these people are looking for a government handout the government is telling them that you can't have an event. You can't have more than 10 people gather. You can't have this many people. You can't have an event. You can't have a, um, you can't have a music, you know, musicians at your bar. You can't have your bar open past a certain time. All of these restrictions are in place that are impeding business. And that's at no fault of the business owner. And so that, you know, it's, it's really hard because the government is saying you can't operate as a business. So do you just go out of business? Do you have to go and, learn a new job skill and do something else. Um, I mean, a lot of people have spent their life doing this and they've spent a long time building a career doing this or building a business or just starting a business. You know, um, a lot of people, you know, started new businesses in 2019, early 2020, because it was a big year. And, you know, like I said, everybody was having, going to have the best year of their life and, um, and it just fell apart and at, and at no fault of anybody's, right? I mean, even the people in other industries outside of our industry who got laid off and, you know, have felt the effects of this, you know, nobody could have seen this coming. And, um, you know, we've really just, you know, as a, uh, as a country, you know, need help to get through it. Um, we, you know, we all pay our taxes and we're Americans and we want to continue to be Americans. And um, it's, you know, we, we pay into the government, you know, every year, uh, you know, in taxes and it, when we need them, we want them to be there for us. So, um, and, you know, so we're making sure that they are, that those things, you know, that when they are there for us, they come through with stimulus and those kinds of things to keep the economy going and keep, you know, food on people's tables that we're able to, uh, as an industry, take advantage of that. Because in, you know, the in entertainment industry is old, but sound reinforcement concerts i mean you're talking about the 50s it, so it's not an old industry 60 or 70 years and so um this has never ever ever happened or crossed anybody's mind nobody's ever had a year where they've had zero revenue in this industry and i mean zero like they haven't been able to do anything just because of restrictions so this is pretty bleak. Are you hopeful for the for the future of the industry or do you think there's going to be some sort of pivot like are, are, is it just doom and gloom all across the board or is there any sort of uh, hope for the future of the industry? So I've been going on with the doom and gloom for too long, I think. So <laughs> yeah, um, a lot of people have transitioned. So a lot of people have moved to virtual events. Um, it's, you know, it's something, it's not paying the bills, um, but it's something. Um, a lot of new technologies have come out, you know, to support virtual events and to make it, you know, make you able to make money on virtual events. Um, events are having a transition, um, you know, the events themselves, the planners, the, you know, the companies that have, uh, one thing I haven't talked about is, you know, like corporate conferences and, you know, where people go and learn about new technology or things that are happening in their industry. Um, those things have, you know, aren't happening in a live setting anymore either. So, um, a big thing with that is doing virtual conferences. And so now there's new technology um, for, you know, interactive virtual events. And so that's becoming, um, I mean, it's a slow transition, but um, it's starting to take effect where people are able to make money and, you know, get into those things. 
um, uh, like I said, a lot of people have taken jobs in other industries and they're waiting for it to come back um, so that they can, you know, get back, on, you know, to their normal, you know, careers. But what we see as an opportunity with this is that um, a lot of events are going to start to become a hybrid. So um, people miss live events. I mean, they're not going away. Um, we just have to wait until it's safe to have, you know, a mass gathering um, and be able to do it safely. And, you know, the, there have been a lot of arguments between, you know, do we open events? Do we not open events? And really what it comes down to is the safety of it. Um, and there haven't been enough studies and it's hard to, um, it, it's hard to get, you know, 20,000 people to go to an arena and be a test case on whether they're going to get the virus or not. So you can't really do a study of a large event. Um, actually, there was one in Germany that happened um, that was pretty successful um, that tested, you know, the safety measures, but that didn't happen until August or September. So, I mean, um, we're just now learning what the effects of a large, you know, audience would be and, you know, seating people four seats apart or three seats apart or, you know, this kind of filtration system in the building or this kind of, you know, um, UV or cleaning technique for cleaning the venue and making sure that, you know, it doesn't stick around and then the people who are sick or not sick and where they sit and how many people get the virus. And so um, we're, you know, still learning all of those things. Um, so there hasn't been a way to really open large events um, safely. So once, you know, we're able to put those things in place and open events safely, people are itching to go back and see concerts and go out and really enjoy themselves, you know, in a live setting and not be cooped up at home or stuck on Zoom meetings all day or, you know, watching virtual events. They want to go back and, you know, there's really, um, there's a magical feeling that comes along with, you know, being at a live event and the, you know, the spontaneity of it and all of that. So um, it's going to come back. It'll come back strong and it'll also be a hybrid where all of the virtual technology that we're figuring out now is going to be implemented on all these same events and they're just going they're, they're going to spend more money on you know at first they may spend less money on the live and more you know and you know kind of balance yeah the virtual versus the live but once the live come back strong comes back strong and they find a virtual audience at the same time additional revenue then yeah. right they're going to be making more money they're going to be spending more money um, because virtual opens up, you know, your conference is not limited to the people who have the money to fly there anymore because people don't have to spend the money to fly there in order to experience some part of the event. So you can have the virtual um, part of it as well as the live part of it. And there's benefits and benefits to both and people who want to go to both. So totally. it's certainly going to change the industry in that way. And there is a lot of opportunity. Excuse me. So how can people get involved and find out more about the Live Events Coalition? Um, so you can visit our website, liveeventscoalition.org. Um, we are, so over the last um, eight or nine months, we've, um, we've rolled out, we are a membership organization. So um, our goal is to represent all of the live events industry. Um, so the 12 million people are really are um, who we're advocating for, um, who work in live events. And as a member, you can volunteer, um, at, you know, and work with us to build the organization. But we've really been focused on um, building a strong organization that's going to last after, you know, COVID ends. We want the organization to continue because um, there are plenty of, um, there are a lot of examples of, you know, ways that the industry um, could uh, be better, both from a, um, uh, you know, just from, you know, recognition from the government. And like I said, these programs, you know, when the policymakers are um, writing bills, we want to be able to be a part of the, um, you know, what comes out of those laws. And, you know, we want to make sure they're going to work for us, or if they're not going to work for us, that, you know, we're making sure they know why and how we can, you know, make it work for us. So we want to continue to represent the live events industry um, after COVID and be able to tackle those things um, because there really is no organization that represents the whole body of the industry. Um, and it's a massive industry. 
that um, just doesn't have representation. I mean, if you look at like the restaurant, you know, there's a restaurant, National Restaurant Association, and there's a um, National uh, Association um, for like hotels and um, things like that. And those associations, you know, they're the ones that are running TV ads that say, you know, wear a mask at hotels and, you know, we want to open hotels safely or, you know, when you're dining out, wear a mask and stay six feet apart. And if you go to the bathroom, wear a mask or whatever the, you know, they're putting out these PSAs for restaurants and they're, you know, really advocating to the people to, um, to do the right thing. But they're also in Washington advocating to policymakers to make sure that restaurants can stay open or they have a plan to open safely. Um, you know, as far as COVID goes, but in normal times, they're advocating for other, you know, things to help the restaurant industry thrive. And that's what we want to be for the live events industry, because it just doesn't exist. Yeah. And, and, and looking forward, even after we kind of get through COVID, you'll, you'll basically help mitigate any future risk of this sort of thing happening again, because you'll, you'll already be in place and in position. So certainly. So my last question is, um, if you were talking to a 17 or 18 year old who is in a band and uh, has a mixer and a couple speakers and they, they want to get into the audio industry in some form or the other, um, you know, what's some advice you'd, you'd give them? Find ways, uh, just find ways to get out there and do it. Um, even if it's free or doesn't make money or, um, you know, if you have to intern, um, I don't necessarily agree with, you know, free internships, but they certainly do have their purpose. And, um, you know, if you need the experience, um, in order to, you know, learn and grow, it's certainly, a, you know, way to, you know, I did an unpaid internship at a, a studio and I learned a lot. And by the end, you know, I was recording tracks and, you know, cutting tracks and things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, I found a local venue that I could do sound at, um, you know, when I was in high school. And then um, once we bought our own equipment, I knew a bit about it, but I did a lot of research and learned as much as I could. And then, you know, went and did it on our own and um, found ways to learn. So it's really, if you don't know something, seek out the answer, find, you know, and then those answers are going to pose more questions and then just continue to, you know, learn as much as you can and find ways to to do what you like doing and um, really making that happen for yourself. Um, and then as long as you continue to look for opportunity that way and show that, you know, it's really about showing that you yourself are um, technically savvy and also are looking to learn, willing to learn, uh, willing to help out, willing to be helpful and, and also just have a positive attitude, um, then you continue to grow and people remember that um, no matter how young you are um, just continue, you know, if you have those few, you know, skills and you're just looking to learn, people are willing to teach um, and you can find ways and just don't give up on it. I mean, if one opportunity doesn't work out, it may just not be a good fit or it, um, you know, maybe you made a mistake and you just have to learn from that and move on. But find somewhere else. I mean, be persistent and find somewhere else that you can learn and do those things. Don't, don't give up. Cool. And how do people find, uh, find out more about you or, or learn more about you or connect with you? Or is there anything you want to plug? What's, what's going on? Um, I guess, uh, you know, I don't really check Facebook that often anymore, but, um, LinkedIn or, uh, I, you know, just email my, uh, if you go to the live events coalition website, you can find me on the about us page and you can email me there. Perfect. And if people drop comments below, I'll route them to you. Cool. So, okay. So that's all. Thanks for coming on. I'm just going to do a little wrap up for the, for the You're pod. Welcome. Um, so up, up, upcoming episodes of the creative truth, we're going to include painters, woodworkers, glass blowers, UX designers, photographers, VFR, VFX artists, and more. If you have suggestions, uh, please send them to wecreatetruth at gmail.com. I ask you to please subscribe, leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform, and visit us at creative-truth, creative-truth.com. Thanks again, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Bye.